Alright. Are we? I can't really tell whether that looks about straight. Yeah. Alright, alright, alright. Alright, alright, people, alright. Inna alhamdulillah wa kafa. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al Mustafa. Wa ala ibadi al ladin al Taba. Wa man bi hudahum ihtada. Wa bi athari ahl al Madin taqtafa. Wa baad. Fa salamu Allahi ala al Qum. Ahlan wa sahlan bikum. Wa marhaban. Wa bienvenidos a todos, mi gente. Wan Ying Lighter and Swagatam, Swagatam people, Swagatam. Alright, so what is going on? Muhammad Ali, Billy is in the house. Alright, people, this looks a bit, uh, I think that should be about right now. Alright, so Billy is in the house. Sarah Amadi, Elizabeth, Zubi, Ahlan wa Sahlan, Inna. Those of you tuning in, people, you know the drill. Click like, click share, share that. Let the fitan and facade begin. <laughs> All right, where's my, uh, where's my tea? All right, so, and my drink, of course. People, my drink. <laughs> Got. It's got to be done, people. It's got to be done. So, what is going on? What is going on? Marco Saeed from Australia. Wasim is asking whether I've started the new series of Vikings. I have not yet, I'm afraid. Uh, right, so let me just share this. Un momento, un momento, por favor. Right. Share this to my... There it is, right there. Click share. All right. People. So today I was... Uh, there was a topic a few people had asked me about. And that was to do with... Uh, marriage and the Guardian. <laughs> Not the Guardian newspaper. <laughs> Uh, as in having a guardian present. So I thought, well, okay. Uh, damn, where did I? <laughs> oh, here it is. All right. So I thought, well, I'll go through some details on that in a moment. Yep. Yep. I'll do that in a moment. Let's see what else is going on first, people. What else is going on? Well... What's been going on, people? Somebody said Arsenal won. Uh, they may have. I don't know. I don't watch. I don't really watch any sports. That's interesting. I mean, for some reason, I just can't see the <laughs> the fascination with it. I, I mean, I can, I can understand the sense of, but I just can't relate to it. It's it must make me totally weird. <laughs> <laughs> but cello weird is a category I'm well used to by now. <laughs> All right, so take up basketball. Oh no, I don't find any of these uh, sports seriously. Not cricket, not football, not anything, and I can't even fathom the fascination that people have with them. <laughs> So, North London dog, Mufti Ibrahim in the house. Mufti Ibrahim? Oh, Ibrahim. A, a Maliki from Coventry, people. Wasik, Sheikh. Right, so what's going on, people? What, what thoughts have been plaguing your mind this past week? Right, can you speak Pashto? How can I? All right, Pashto, that's what we're talking about. I was, I'll tell you something on a side note. This week I was looking into, it's a bit, I don't know whether it's interesting or boring for some of you, but I was looking into uh, prehistoric cave paintings. <laughs> People are thinking, oh no, Mufti needs some serious psychiatric help. <laughs> oh, I need it. 
I'm well beyond that stage of needing psychiatric help. I'm like way gone. That was like in childhood. <laughs> so, but it, it really is fascinating, I'm telling you. It's uh, so basically since uh, prehistoric times, so we're looking anything from 10,000 to 40,000 years ago, there are cave paintings, okay? So art that was done in caves by by Homo sapiens who were from the Stone Age to pre-Ice Age or during the Ice Age and things like that. Or maybe some of it was done by Neanderthals. We don't, we're not social, but generally most of it was pretty much by Homo sapiens. And it's really interesting. It's fascinating, the, the kind of symbols. So altogether, some researchers have kind of gone out there and exhausted all the symbols that they have. And they have about 32 approximately symbols, um, which is still a bit very primitive for a language, as in a written language. But they, they they were drawing certain things that they were seeing, and it's mainly animals. So they're drawing things like, uh, like, like mammoths or horses, but their horses. This is pre... because horses being tamed by human beings is only... Um, so many thousands, it's only a few thousand years old, but prior, this is back then, so horses were still the, the ancestors of the modern day horse, but they were probably slightly different, and things like that, so animals that may have been, that are today extinct, but we can get an insight into them by looking at these cave paintings, and some of them are they depict humans in a very, uh, they don't usually focus on humans at all, but sometimes they might have some kind of like stick drawing. Uh, so it's not so developed, the art. But whereas the animals are very well developed, some of them. You, you'll be shocked if you saw them. You'd think, wow, like they, they definitely, I mean, I couldn't do something like that. I mean, they drew them really well, some of them. Uh, very artistic. So the shocking thing is there was a human being who we, let's say 30, 20,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago, who we will never know. Yet, we will have some communication with him till today or her through what they wanted us to see. It was obviously a world that they were seeing. So... These things, they they put them down and we now can see them as well. And it's amazing. So I, th I think that's, I find it really fascinating, that kind of stuff. Uh, the human story, how humans kind of developed and stuff like this. And, and also how they, um, so there's certain prehistoric stuff about, uh, but anyway, this is for, I, I would encourage people to really look into stuff like this. I find it incredibly fascinating what what's this please give your insights on the north sentinel tribe living in prehistoric era from islamic perspective right this is an interesting question now so these people that lived back then and we've got by the way figurines so they drew so one of the earliest kind of uh, statues it's not a statue but like a figurine that we have is of the lion man so it's a human but with the f the head of a lion and but not the lions as we know them today with the mane but just kind of without the mane uh or or either a very small one now that's probably dated almost 40,000 years old i mean that is whoa <laughs> back then and there's a lot of figurines of women as well, by the way, especially not so much their, and even some of the drawings, not so much their head. <laughs> they just chopped their head off. They just said, well, that's useless. <laughs> but more so their bodies, right? So especially the lower bodies and, and I suppose up to the bosoms as well, but they, they, they and, and well accentuated. So people are not quite sure what was this, were, were they simply just, saying, look, here's a, a woman, we're going to sculpt a little figurine out of her, or was this a, a goddess of fertility, or was this just, uh, you know, some people 
just uh, what, what was it we we will never truly know was it some people having a bit of <laughs> a bit of naughty naughty fun that's <laughs> in saying oh they were saying well little do you know son but a time will come when <laughs> when they'll have movies for this kind of stuff <laughs> but uh <laughs> for now we'll have to just do with these cave art drawings <laughs> Was that prehistoric porn? <laughs> Could have been. We will never know, truly. But I don't think it was. <laughs> I think it was more abstract and meaningful than that. So the question is, what was, I mean, what, what, what was going on? What message were they trying to give? Were these people, what was their relationship with God? So, uh, that's, that's an interesting, interesting one. That were prophets sent to these people? Um, hmm. One would think, well, why not? Um, as in some message, some understanding. Um, you see, like, what? I'll tell you what's interesting. So, these prehistoric people, or these prehistoric uh, paintings, carve... Uh, cave art that is found throughout the world very on different continents altogether by the way the symbols very clearly or these kind of pictographs that they have overlap so for example the way they use some things might be common like okay they're going to draw a hand so they have like a hand that is uh painted white as in it's it and they have a just the outline of a hand so they call it like a positive hand or a negative hand but so one might say well that's just the even kids do things like that you know they just put their hand on a wall and draw over it all right fine but the other kind of like the the lines that they drew like the zigzags in a certain way and these were actually very overlapping like on different continents so whether you're looking at in Asia, whether you're looking in Europe. Now, the similarities are that strong that it's it's quite difficult to say that this is just simply a coincidence. That they all seem to be doing very similar shapes. So one theory, and I'm inclined to this theory, is that this is because, in essence, it traces it back to one origin that the people what that were the proto uh what they call the uh in for example in this case the indo-european prototype people the the earlier 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 people that split off into all these people um that they were one obviously in essence just one people that kind of broke off now this teaching or whatever it was that they were passing on must have been something coming down for millennia that they must have passed down through teachings and stuff so the fact that and language is, is is another really interesting although we don't know what language they spoke exactly except it must have been that proto you know indo-european or whatever it was these kind of but today the over overlaps in language are several words you when you trace them down they're too much for coincidence we know that these languages were ultimately connected um, you know, like uh, the other day I was just saying, uh, here's, here's a word, daughter. Now, it's interesting how, obviously, in English that we write the G-H, uh, obviously don't pronounce it unless you, doctor, <laughs> unless you want to. But the interesting thing is that, you see, like this and it's kind of uh, Middle Eastern, the, the especially the Farsi, dukhtar, um, which is where this would have originated from. So Dukhtar in Farsi, I even in, it's used sometimes in Urdu as a very eloquent uh, word as well, but Dukhtar means daughter. Like this, you will get so many words that trace their roots back, and that's language, but the people, so if they had a message to do with God and things like this, it would have passed down over the, uh, over the kind of eons that passed and Obviously, it would have changed as well. But in my understanding, they would have had some message, some connection, but not like a kind of sharia the way we have a sharia or other civilizations had a sharia. 
because these people were prehistoric, they were pre-civilization. Remember, these were cavemen people. <laughs> they did not live in societies the way we live in societies. Agriculture is only about 9,000 years old. Can you believe that, people? 9,000 years, that's it. <laughs> Prior to that, there was no farming. Okay, so... <laughs> right. Was Sheikh... The theory is that the rock is from outer space. Perhaps, perhaps. Rubama. Rubama. <laughs> this word, Rubama. Perhaps. Huh? Perhaps. Talves, talves. Was Sheikh Ibn Abdul Wahhab's Indian teacher Hayat Ibn Sindhi a Sufi? Um, right, the, the Indo Pak Ahlul Hadith people, so those like, uh, you know, Maulana Nazir Hussain, and prior to that, a lot of them were very w different to the kind of Wahhabi, uh, Saudi, I say Saudi, but it's pre Saudi, the Najdi kind of Wahhabis. Um, the Ahlul Hadith from India were very, uh, they, they were strange. So on one hand, they were very Sufic. On the other hand, they were very um, anti-Bid'a as well. So it's quite strange, that, but they were different. Like if you read them, they, they don't, you'd be a bit confused. So they don't think of, they, they definitely uh, seem very uh, supportive of Tasawwuf and things like that. Um, not necessarily, not necessarily. You know, somebody had asked me before, by the way, I've used the term Wahhabi, and somebody had asked me that, uh, all right, there's a question here by Marco Said, survivors of Noah's flood equals proto-Indo-Europeans. Ah, <laughs> uh, Marco G, Marco Polo. <laughs> Where are you taking Nuh alayhi salam to? <laughs> You're taking him to the cavemen era. <laughs> Nuh alayhi salam wasn't from the cavemen era. <laughs> Nuh alayhi salam lived in civilization. So, right, no, definitely not. Nuh alayhi salam wouldn't have been like from the cavemen. and th As in, like he wasn't from prehistoric man like that. So this uh, Nuh alayhi salam would have been uh the prophet noah would have been from 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 civ from as in history at least i don't i mean i don't know exactly but he wouldn't have been like from the ice age and before then we, he would have been definitely post agriculture um and noah alayhi salam's flood was not a global flood okay it was just a regional flood that's all it was uh, right, what was I saying prior to that? Right, oh, so I got, um, uh, Madawana endorse apostasy. Yes or, yes or no? <laughs> yes or no? This one? Yes or no? <laughs> this one or this one? <laughs> yes or no? Which one? You know, there's that. <laughs> there's this meme of this guy, and he's kind of his his eyes are like, but he's they like that. He's kind of like cross-eyed, but not cross-eyed as in this way, but like they they out there like that. The the, the pupils, and he's holding a gun, <laughs> and the meme says, "Which peep 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 gave this peep 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 a gun?" <laughs> Because his one eye is looking there, one eye is looking there. It's like some people are going to get. <laughs> ah, right. So, right. So, what's going on? Joanna Sahiba, Ahlan wa Sahlan, Ahlan wa Sahlan, Joanna G. Right. So, so as I was saying, yes, some people had objected to, uh, I've used the term sometimes, uh, Wahhabi, uh, when I've been answering some questions. So, just to respond to that. This term, if you check the fatawa of Ib, uh, Bimbaz, Sheikh Bimbaz, and uh, Uthaymin, Sheikh Uthaymin, right? So if you check their fatawa, so in the Majmu al uh, Rasail of Uthaymin, he answers this question on the term Wahhabiyah. 
and Bimbaz in his fatawa, which you can find online, he's asked this question that there are some people they call um, the followers, uh, they call us uh, or they call us as in them Wahhabis. How do we respond to this? So in both of them, they respond. Sheikh Bimba, Sheikh Uthaymeen says that this is, uh, he actually himself uses the term Wahhabi to refer to. He says Wahhabis are, sorry, his question was more about do they praise the Prophet and stuff. And he says, of course, Wahhabis love the Prophet and so on. So he himself uses this term. But more clearly, Bimbaz states that the people, Wahhabis are the people of Tawheed, and he says that this title Wahhabi is a sense of pride, which we should wear with pride. So this, they actually um, own this title, so there's no harm in me using it when they themselves use it. You know, this one, not nice, you know. If, if, they're gonna, if people are going to tell me off for using it, but then they're going to use it themselves. This one, this one, confusing, you know, confusing. So, right. Are the Wahhabis from Banu Tamim? Ah, that's a, to be honest, I'm not so sure. I can check it up. Uh, why Gangu Teli don't use it? <laughs> ah, where are our friends? Today I'll be covering some Hadith uh, points in a moment when we go over the Hadith that can marriage happen without a wali without a guardian. Um, so what else is going on people? What else? What are some questions? What else? Let me see. Anything interesting? Let me take a look at some questions submitted uh, online. Huh? Password? Huh? Password? Double password? <laughs> Which reminds me, reminds me of a poem. It says, the poem says, Zinda the jina chut gaya, piyase the pina chut gaya. Wow, 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 wow. That we were alive and that we lost the ability to live, that we were thirsty but we could not drink. Zinda the to jina chut gaya, piyase the to pina chut gaya. Bivi ko phone ka password kya mila winter me pasina chut gaya. <laughs> he says that <laughs> that was because of the <laughs> that because my wife found out the password to my phone uh, in winter we started sweating. <laughs> That's why you don't need one you should have you see they can't then finding out the password isn't a problem if you've got two passwords. <laughs> right, so let's take a look, people. Cha, wah, huh? Zinda the jina chut gaya. Pyaase the pina chut gaya. Let me see some questions that people have submitted. Uh, how should Ch Ch Imran Ali asks the question? I'm sure Zara has both your passwords. Oh, thank God she doesn't. <laughs> oh, she's still way too small yet. But uh, how should children respond to abusive parents? The general consensus seems that abuse should be tolerated. And we should treat parents with great kindness, not even saying oof. <laughs> he wrote <laughs> oof as double O F oof. <laughs> that just sounds so much more like oof. <laughs> it's the style. No matter what they put us through. Oof. Imran Ali seems to be a tormented soul. We need to offer some assistance to <laughs> to our fellow Facebook friend. So what is the that is not true. You don't. You do not need to put up with abuse. <laughs> you, you don't need to say, "Oof." <laughs> you know when you're getting beats and you go, "Oof, <laughs> oof." <laughs> no, I'm sure. 
I'm sure those days are pretty much over now. <laughs> those good old days when your parents would give you military grade training for free. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, but the answer is no, of course not. This is talking about people being rude to their parents. It's not talking about people putting up with abuse. That would be, that would just be silly. That, that would be wrong. They do need to seek the correct avenues in escaping abuse. Wherever it's, abuse should be condemned and not tolerated. Obviously, I mean, there's, uh, there's a certain amount that parents would and ought to reprimand and their children. They ought to tell them off. On certain things that's for sure that is obviously if they're messing about if they're doing certain things if the parents don't tell them off then who will <laughs> right but that said that doesn't mean they start abusing them <laughs> it doesn't mean they say what you've done wait let me put on the knuckle duster <laughs> huh you've, you've made a mess yet wait there knuckle <laughs> It doesn't mean like, like obviously, uh, parents ought to reprimand but not abuse. So there's a, a distinction. And in the UK, I'm sure different places have different urf and different uh, practices and what they allow. Uh, in the UK, I believe it's, uh, what is it? Is it like... Uh, I forgot the loose ter terminology that they apply to it. I think it's it falls within that they c can use kind of reasonable force to reprimand a child. But what does that mean? They they don't define it on purpose. Whereas if it's not their child, they can't use any force. There is no force. It would be illegal. And if it was their own child, I think my understanding is they term it as like reasonable. But then what would be unreasonable is left to people's discretion, I think. <laughs> or <laughs> now they're going to be like a char. So Mufti Abu Lay thinks he can use reasonable for. <laughs> You're like, well, officer, <laughs> I, th I thought this stick was pretty reasonable. <laughs> not, not. A joke, it's joking, okay, <laughs> right? So, all right, Amani, <laughs> hola. So, I hope that answers that. Let's say I sin. Ibrahim is asking, Let's say I sin, okay? Let's say, is everything predetermined by God? A cha cha. So, you want to blame your sins on God? <laughs> Let's say I sin. But isn't this God who's really God? <laughs> Why am I gambling again, God? Why are you making me gamble? <laughs> Why does God play these games? <laughs> no, it's not God, my friend. It's you. <laughs> okay. This is, it's like that, you know, that line that it's not you, it's me. That This is that line here. It's not God. It's you, my friend. It's you. Mm -hmm. So, the verse that Allah says, fire. Oh, I've answered this before. Imam Sadiq says that free will isn't 100%. Also, it isn't 100% predestined. Okay. How should the child respond to verbal abuse? In intimidating talk by the parent to oof or not to oof? <laughs> I think it's... You see, it's... I think these kind of things, people may need to seek professional uh, advice and guidance. Uh, also, it's it's tricky on what, you see, children, you see, because it's a tricky situation, because on one hand, children can exaggerate a hell of a lot. <laughs> children can be very dramatic. But on the other hand, if abuse is actually taking place, then... You know, that shouldn't be. But here the person is asking about verbal abuse. Um, hmm. I mean, it's a, I, it's a tricky kind of question, really. I think I'm not quite sure what, to, what that entails in terms of saying verbal abuse. 
Does it mean like the odd swear? Does it mean like turning their life into a hell? I mean, it's it's sad really to see how some people will treat their... I think people don't realise to what extent they shatter lives by, um, by traumatising uh, children. So... And one thing I always, I in fact, I say, this is not restricted to children, for adults as well. I always encourage people that never, and be weary, that never break people's confidence. That if somebody, for example, somebody's trying to learn something. I mean, it's different. Sometimes people might have a joke and laugh amongst peers. But when somebody who is inferior in that skill to you uh, is learning something, don't break their confidence if they ever ask you or if they do things like that always kind of uh, assist them because th that is what kills talent it kind of stops it dead in the tracks because by doing things like uh, by kind of mocking them ridiculing them at that stage that will prevent growth and and people don't realize with children how much how damaging this can be you know may Allah make things easy for such people wherever they are because there's so many people so many children with incredible talent but I think it kind of dies away withers away because the parents might curse them or mock them or ridicule them and people shouldn't do that especially and, and it's shocking that they of all people they do it with their own children it's amazing that you know I mean I say amazing in a in a shocking, sarcastic way that you'd never think that they would do it to their own children, but they do. And, and in fact, that's the people that they do it to, uh, crippling them in terms of talent for the future. So I just think it's, it's you know, may Allah assist these people wherever they are. I think, and one thing people should never do as well um, in terms of, I think, to, to boost confidence, they should never mock or ridicule or belittle the appearance of children. Okay, in fact, they should tell children that, you know, if, if for, oh, that, oh, that's beautiful, oh, if they've, you know, oh, you look beautiful, or you look like this. They shouldn't kind of ever put them down because a lot of people grow up with things like major insecurity, inferiority complexes and 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 most of these people <laughs> i say most most of these people are absolutely fine there's nothing you know they're not like uh, to be kind of just <laughs> blunt they're not like ugly people or they're not like people with kind of deformities or things like this but they feel they perceive themselves as though they are they feel that they're kind of like too ugly or they feel that they're too um you know that they're, they're too incompetent or they, they're just not and and this is something that they carry throughout life so i would say it probably begins with childhood so i know somebody said it's shocking that this isn't common sense in a way it is common sense but people just they just take it too easily they they just kind of uh, <laughs> I think Pakistani parents are probably the worst <laughs> at this. <laughs> They're just probably, honestly, I don't, I don't think there's. Uh, I think they sit on the throne of uh, <laughs> of like how to destroy, the <laughs> how to completely pulverize, decimate the <laughs> the confidence of children. But yeah, so they definitely do. And in fact, in in Urdu, it's interesting that, you know, like we have sarcasm in English. So Urdu has a kind of sarcasm, but it's it's very different because the, the sarcasm in Urdu, like which they call either tans or like tana, tana dena, like these kind of things are not, you see, sarcasm in English is kind of funny. So it's meant to be funny. But the one in Urdu is meant to be malicious. <laughs> it's it, having any hint of humor is just a byproduct. It's in fact it's a it's a far off effect. It's not even trying. <laughs> you know, so people are really really uh, sarcastic. I think I narrated once before that there used to be this uh, this guy who studied with us in Pakistan, and he was. Uh, 
in Pakistan, people are just ruthless about stuff like this. And this was when I was doing Hifd in Pir Karam Shah's Sahib's Madrasa in Islamabad. And there was this guy, that um, the young lad who was doing Hifd, and he was very dark skinned. So, um, so they used to call him, <laughs> they used to call him tube light. <laughs> they say tube light. And they used to call <laughs> so this is the, the kind of sarcasm that they have. It's a very malicious, malignant kind of sarcasm. Right. So <laughs> it's funny sometimes these things, but they're not trying to be, they are being funny, but they're not, they're being very maliciously uh, funny. It's not like sarcasm in English, which may have some subtle, but it's more humorous. Right. So somebody's asking the question. Let's move on, folks. Averroes is the closest to Aristotle ever. Averroes is Ibn Rushd, the Maliki legend and Don. Ibn Rushd, there were two Ibn Rushds. Uh, how credible is the Quilliam report on Pakistani sex groomers? How credible? I haven't read the Quilliam report, but I've said before on, on uh, Pakistani sex groomers that this, see, the problem with this is by trying to, it, I feel that the grooming gangs are a problem. Uh, that I think everybody would pretty much agree on. Um, but I feel the problem with high, ident identifying a race with this is I just think that's unfair because you see it's okay in that nature in that nature like saying that there's gangs of like people who are between their 20s to 30s or 20s to even 40s or even to their 50s but generally let's say younger uh, people uh, who are kind of like riffraff if I, if I can use that term they're kind of like in just road men, that, that kind of crew of people who happen to be sexually exploiting girls, teenage girls. Um, this is found, it is found amongst uh, Pakistani kind of, some of these people, they do happen to be Pakistani, those, the culprits. But then sexual offences as a whole, uh, and much, you know, with, with children much younger than that even, are found predominantly with let's say white people now that doesn't mean we would start saying that pedophilia is a white problem um although if you're gonna you know if one was to look statistically at the whole world um infants finding sexual kind of gratification from infants it sh shock i mean disturbingly i'm sure it is found in many parts of the world uh, unfortunately, but the way it's found in Europe and America is disturbing. The level to which it's found. And uh, you don't generally, I'm just saying generally, you wouldn't find that amongst other societies that are very underdeveloped in the world. Uh, in that level, like you wouldn't get people seeking sexual gratification from a toddler. Like, I mean, they wouldn't see that generally speaking, but yet it's found in these societies. So one could, if they were trying to put forward some academic argument, say, oh, this is, uh, uh, you know, it's a very Eurocentric kind of problem. And, and obviously the Americans coming from Europe, in essence, the Anglo or the white, it's a white problem. But that would still be wrong. Why? Because we are then just stereotyping. And we're kind of hooking a whole race, or not even a race, a mega, like just so many races, really. Because white isn't one race. But but I'm just saying, in a similar way to, to, to attach the entire Pakistani people <laughs> to, to what some people have perpetrated is, is wrong. Um, so I strongly condemn um, anything that leads to that, although I do... Uh, recognize that this there is a problem uh, that people some people feel that oh it's okay to exploit or they may have especially in the in the past felt that it was okay to exploit certain girls and especially because of the drug thing and stuff like this and and help must be provided to these young girls 
and these people must be cracked down on. I mean, they must catch these people and punish them. That kind of stuff I do strongly support, but I, I'm against attaching any racial card to these crimes. It's just like saying, well, you know, you could go through London and say, well, I don't know if you're going to look at all the criminals and let's just say, I mean, I haven't done this research, but let's just say if we we're going to say, well, oh, a lot of the the street crime, the gang crime happens. A lot of the people arrested were uh, black, let's just say. So now this is a black problem. That, that That's not right, saying stuff like that. So this just supports racism and it supports the kind of right wing argument. So I haven't read the Quilliam report, but if that's what it's doing, then I strongly condemn that. OK. So, right, what is going on, people? What is going on? Can you explain the hadith of the bitter of Buda'a? How can it? Right, so what's your thoughts on the quote? If you don't have a shaykh, then you, then shaitan is your shaykh. All right. <laughs> so surprisingly, Afghanistan only had 160 cases of rape. <laughs> Get real, man. <laughs> no, but look, you know, in some part, like countries like Afghanistan, and this isn't to kind of, but just being real, that's because the 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 people they're raping are boys, okay? And you see, th this is the irony that they, yes, on one hand, it's so, to violate the honor of a woman is seen as so, oh my God, like, you know, like people would go mad, like so villages, it would create war. So people are not going to and then women are not around so much. So they're all in their houses. So you're not going to find women just wandering on their own. Uh, so the opportunity for them to commit these crimes are less as it is. And then the consequences are so huge that they're thinking, well, this could lead to war and so on. And so then they just rape boys instead because the boys won't say anything and and everybody's just like oh well don't worry about it. <laughs> I mean it's not a laughing matter but I mean the the irony is so bloody oh my god that is so you have such a see the contrast you have Afghanistan and then India <laughs> where it's just a green light for everything and I don't know I don't know uh, is it okay to aspire to have fame, such as being a pro footballer? Of course it is. Um, it, having, you see, wanting to be praised is such a base human desire. It's it's shocking, actually, how much of a strong desire human beings have in wanting to be praised. Um in fact, I was listening to, um, there was a whole, and it was it was a particular study on, and it was a discussion on religions and things like, and they were trying to say, well, how religion has tapped into this base instinct that humans have, this kind of base desire to wanting to be, uh, to be praised. In fact, it was part of the discussion on, um, there's, uh, it's a book I'm going through right now called, uh, uh, the bonobo and the atheist so the bonobo kind of monkeys that we that exist and their similarity to 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 humans but the whole discussion is on morality it's really it's a fascinating book by dr franz de wall i know last time i was saying and people were thinking i don't know he must be asian or something <laughs> he's not i think he, he's definitely european uh, so de and then a separate wall Right, W double A L France, uh, Doctor Franz de Waal. So he he has a few books, but in his book, um, the Bonobo and the Atheist. So he's discussing morality, but there's a point where he discusses Nietzsche and the whole is man. Sorry, he says, yeah, is man a blunder of God, or is God a blunder of man? And th that was a a quote by Nietzsche. And this whole discussion on Sue's about morality and stuff like this. Uh, but there they speak of this as well, that this base instinct of wanting to be praised. And they say, well, how religion exploited that. 
But put that aside. In the Quran as well, you find that even the prophets had said that وَجَعَلِّي لِسَانَ صِدْقٍ فِي الْآخِرِينَ And and here Imam Qurtubi on this verse of the Quran com, uh, in his commentary highlights that in his tafsir that you see the Prophet saying and make those who come after me have a uh, like a a kind of a praising kind of tongue or a it says وَجَعَلِّي لِسَانَ صِدْقٍ فِي الْآخِرِينَ That they say that, oh, I was an honest person. You understand? That them commending my truthfulness or me being honest, those who come after me. And this is an interesting dalil that uh, many fuqaha use from the Qur'an to say, well, there's no harm in wanting to be praised. Um, and it's in fact a human uh, instinct. Uh, it's it's like a base desire, so I think there's nothing wrong in that. Obviously, there's uh, there's arrogance which is condemned. So if a person was to kill why, kill why, ankh me kuch chalega. Right, people, Layla's here. You wake so chalo yah chalo. Is is ek yah kuch upar chalo yah. Okay, chalo bol laga lo uske upar. She doesn't want to... Right, so... May I? Okay, people, just two seconds, two seconds. I'm coming right back. <laughs> right, sorry about that, folks. Well, where were we? Sorry, just, I don't know. First of all, Layla shouldn't be awake. But secondly, I don't know what she's... I don't know what she's done. Probably just her hair gone into her eye or something. Right, so, folks, what is going on? What is going on? Let's take some of these... What do you say about Adnan Rashid's statement that Shabir Ali is no authority when it comes to matters of Islam? Is it necessary to be schooled at some traditional religious madrasa? What if a man is defending Islam for decades but is schooled at some secular institute with good qualifications, PhD? And how do you compare religious education taught at some good traditional madrasa and at some good university? Um, Omar Ali is asking this question. Well, I mean, first of all, I'm not so sure what uh, Dr. Shabir Ali has studied at an Islamic institute. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. Um, but that said, Dr. Shabir Ali is definitely more qualified than Adnan Rashid. Because Adnan Rashid is by no... Uh, I mean, he's most certainly not by any measure, a scholar in Islam. Uh, he's, a, he's somebody who preaches and does that one. And he goes to Hyde Park and does debates and things like that with uh, Christians. I mean, as far as I'm aware, he, and this is Adnan Rashid himself stating, he doesn't understand Arabic. Uh, I don't even think he can read Arabic, as in read it without the vowels, as in actual Arabic. Um, so let alone things like be trained in fiqh, usulul fiqh, uh, be trained in the Sharia, have studied the different madhabs, 
uh, having studied, for example, the usul of hadith, having studied the actual books of hadith. I'm not actually aware, as, as opposed to maybe he's done independent reading or uh, listened to lessons, but by no means is he a scholar. Maybe, I'm not sure what Dr. Shabir Ali has done. I have listened to some of Dr. Shabir Ali's uh, kind of uh, things on the Quran. I definitely feel that he is most certainly qualified to speak on Islam. Uh, I feel from what I've heard, his, his knowledge on, uh, I've heard him speak from the Quranic perspective and it's on point. From what I've heard, he has a show called uh, Let the Quran Speak. And it's a very good show where he answers questions on YouTube. So definitely he would have my my backing, the Mufti, Mufti endorsement. Chalta hai yaar, chalta hai. Mm, but I mean, some of the, but these other people who just go to like Hyde Park and do their da'wah, these people, I don't, you see the problem, I think a lot of them are sincere, or at least they began sincerely. I mean, I don't know how sincere they are now. But the problem with them is that they, you see, they... <clears throat> They, they begin doing something good. So you get people like, let's say, you had Dawah Man. This is all one kind of crew, by the way. So you have like, um, let's say now Adnan Rashid, whose name's come up. Or you had uh, Dawah Man. I think that's one of his, used to be his student. Then he obviously refuted him. And But you got people like Ali Dawah and Muhammad Hijab and... Um, I don't, I don't really, I, I think there's one, two others. I've seen them on YouTube. I don't know their names. But th you see, the thing with this is I think they are really good for the fact that or the way they began in the sense, I think, I think, that they began in the sense that there was a vacuum. Somebody's asking questions, as in they began sincerely. I think this is how the beginning, the, the kind of, the etiology <laughs> right? of how this uh, virus began. So the thing is that it began with a good intention and a good practice of, well, there's a vacuum. People are asking questions about Islam. How do we answer them? So, oh, sorry, nobody is there to say anything. So these people stood there. They gave voluntarily give their time for Islam, which is very noble. And I commend that. Uh, so what happened is they started to get a following. Alhamdulillah, I mean, they got huge following, surprisingly, they have a massive following, some of them. Um, so they start to get a following. And then, so what happens naturally, you see, Muslims start to follow them. So first, when they're speaking about Christians are wrong on this, or like, let's say people like Zakir Naik, for example, who was, he'd studied deeply comparative religion. So he did all these shows and debates on Christianity and uh, and it's along that tradition, isn't it, uh, Adnan Rashid, that uh, on comparative religion, Christianity is wrong here, Christianity, Christianity. And then what happens is Muslims then start asking you questions about Islam. Because Muslims, okay, they were impressed that you know so much about the Gospels, but they that doesn't affect them. So then they start saying, well, oh, in Islam, what is this? Now, these people feel that they ought to have an opinion on Islam. <laughs> But the truth is, none of these people have ever traditionally studied Islam. So then they just seem to, and most of these people are pretty much, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, pretty much they're all Wahhabi. So the problem is that they are pretty much all just influenced by Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia, for God's sake, with its <laughs> Bedouinized Islam. Uh, <laughs> I tell you, if it was just to the Bedouins of Arabia today, we would, uh, <laughs> you might as well get, throw that Islam out the window. So the thing is that, so Saudi, the Saudi kind of Bedouinized Islam that they carry in, in these Western countries then and start pre preaching it is, is massively problematic because it then forces many Muslims to, I mean, some Muslims fine, blindly follow, but other Muslims will then abandon Islam. And they'll be like, well, uh, that doesn't make any sense. And so they will just say, well, this religion doesn't make any sense to me. So this is why Islam came for the whole world. It came for Bedouins. I accept that. <laughs> but we are not Bedouins, my friend. <laughs> 
let the Bedouins deal with their own kind of version, the Bedouin version of Islam. For us city folks, <laughs> born and raised in the West, for us Islam, it came for us as well. So we have, uh, and it came to take on and to be a kind of paragon of mercy and compassion for everybody, wherever they are. So yes, yeah, so that's why we need more homegrown kind of scholars. Okay. You can clearly see that it's haram for them to use. Can everyone hear him? Abstain from answering. Sheikh Ahmad Didat, I have to say, I've had a great respect for, and I still do. Uh, you know, may Allah have mercy on him. He, he was a legend in his own right. But he came in a day and age when people were doing that. It was a kind of brutal cutthroat debating scene and he was a part of that and to be fair he never used to delve into islamic issues so i have huge respect for uh you know Ustad ahmad d that i do uh, you know may allah have mercy on him i i don't critique him by the way when i'm saying Z zakir naik i think kind of uh <laughs> got a little confused along the way he started to think he's also a sheikh in islam as well <laughs> I'm a medical doctor. <laughs> the brother has a beautiful question. <laughs> so, so what's going on? Mufti, should we support Aira? I don't, uh, I don't really know too much about um, Aira. I know it's got um, Abdurrah Abdurrahim Green. Abdurrahim? Abdurrahim, Abdurrahim Green. And it's got Hamza Tortsis. Um, I think if unless they're not part of it anymore, so I don't, I don't know. Um, I know they were involved in that were trying to fight atheism with their debates, and but in all honesty, it failed. And you know, you see things like even, and I think now Hamza Tortsis has kind of uh, changed his direction, or is looking to change his direction. I'm pretty sure he has changed his direction, because that direction has failed. You see, you realize that Salafis, if you come from, I don't know how, my understanding is Aira w was from that Salafi kind of, but it wasn't so hardcore, I don't know, I think it was, but it, my understanding was definitely from that background of a kind of Wahhabi influence. See, the problem with that is they, you, they realize that they can't, see, these people are not utterly pro-reason, but they're using reason against atheists who are pure pro-reason. So it just takes them a little catching up once they know enough about religion to flip it on you. And then you're stuck. So because you don't know how to how to outwit that. Because, you see, you're trying to say, well, the Quran has all these scientific miracles and it has this and it has that. But then on the other hand, you yourself are not prepared to accept science. So... Or you not wholeheartedly accept science or the scientific findings or you struggle. And you know this argument of the Quran because the Arabic is so amazing, the Arabic is so amazing. I mean, but yet none of these people understand that Arabic themselves. So it doesn't, these arguments are, have long been flawed. So I think we need to move away from this kind of an approach to just reconnecting with God. That's it for people. That religion, it provides that channel. That's all it does. And we ought to just try to be better human beings. That's all. Uh, I don't think this other thing is really. I think it just it's gonna it backfires so badly. Um, Mufti Saab, come to Toronto. <laughs> inshallah, inshallah. Why not? Why not? Right. So, what is going on? What are the regular voluntary prayers in the Maliki Madhab? Um, Look, voluntary prayers are whatever you want to pray. Just pray them. Don't worry about it. You don't need to keep count. <laughs> you know, you're giving on to God by such a cha. So I can do two here. I can do four here. A <laughs> cha. But when you ask, you ask for it unlimited. <laughs> Look, I'm not saying you have to pray voluntary prayers. Okay, many people don't. I definitely would uh, slack <laughs> in doing just about do the obligatory just about. <laughs> right. So I'm not going to make a claim on praying all these voluntary prayers and things like this. But 
if you even legends in the past like Imam Malik, you know, when when somebody wrote to Imam Malik to criticize him, they said that oh you we've never seen you really ever you know you don't engage in enough you don't pray voluntary prayers you never do voluntary fasts you know like what kind of an imam are you <laughs> they said to imam malik you eat meat every day like you indulge and back then this was like seen as a luxury so imam malik said he said apun ka style hai baas not but in his own way he said that i eat meat because it gives he said it gives me a good posture you know like he said it builds it builds the muscle that's what he actually said he said that i eat meat because it it gives me an upright and strong body and he said that and people of knowledge ought to take care of their physique because if they uh have a strong presence then they are respected and through them knowledge is respected what a don what a don and that was imam malik but my point coming back to this nafal is look if you're going to do nafal relax you can do whatever whatever you want okay you don't need to be so uptight about oh i can only give six here or i can only do this or i can only do this and all this that people have said you know like in the hanafi madhab they'll say there's two nafal after dhuhr or there's uh two nafal after maghrib or some people will say there's two nafal after this nafal that they say is not sunnah right because if it was done by the prophet it would be called sunnah <laughs> so they call they say there's two sunnah then there's two nafal so the question is where the hell did the nafal come from if the prophet never taught them? <laughs> so let me get this right the fard came from allah the sunnah came from the prophet's teaching so who did the nafal come from so they say yeah the nafal yeah our ulama said you should just they just put them there so that that's true ask them ask them where did the nafal come from it never it can never it cannot be in a hadith by definition it cannot come from the prophet because if it came from the prophet then it wouldn't be called nafal it ought to be called sunnah even if it's sunna ghair muakkada non emphasized but it ought to be called sunna if it's from the prophet the fact that it's called nafal means it's not from the prophet this is a voluntary thing that's been put there if it's i understand that the prophet said you can pray nafal whenever you, you know pray nafal like as in it's unrestricted so i could just get up now and pray whatever nafal i wanted and the prophet taught us we can pray nafal as a gene- as a genre but to say dhuhr has two nafal at the end of it or maghrib has two nafal at the end of it where did that nafal come from as in as an attachment to that prayer because it never came from the prophet because then it would be called sunnah so see this one this one is it it just takes a little thinking and then it all adds up and you're like ah so it's not true so i would say look if you're going to pray nafal fine go for it you know you're a better person than i am but you don't need to count it as in you don't need to be worried that i can only do six or only do this just do whatever you can do don't worry about it don't worry about it people right this thing about uh about marrying without a wali okay wali where's wali <laughs> where's wali people where's wali we got to play that game so a wali is a guardian uh especially when it's to do with the girl okay so a father or somebody it could be an uncle or it could be the grandfather but it's a male guardian now The question is so first of all let me tell you the rulings that the madhabs have the scholars how they interpreted this and then what does this whole discourse base itself on and then let's take a look at some of those uh, hadith on a separate note actually before we begin that I'll just highlight this is actually a very fascinating book um it's an extraction of all the problem or 
generally the problematic narrations of Imam Zuhri. Somebody had asked me about Imam Zuhri as a narrator of hadith that Dar Qutni has kind of extracted. Imam Dar Qutni. Why Dar Qutni? Because he has a major book called His Ilal. Um, which is in about 10 volumes. I do have it right over there, people. Right over there. Let me, sorry, let me, let me, over there. <laughs> right over there, people. So, uh, and it's a major work. He's also the same scholar that critiqued uh, Sahil Bukhari. Uh, he was a major, a legend in his time for, for hadith criticism and hadith uh, sciences, really. So, now, uh, this particular work has just focused on Imam Zuhri's narrations. Why? Because so much come to us from him. All right, now, so as an example, I mean, this is not what I'm going to be looking at, but as an example, you will find, uh, let's say there's a section in here. I mean, there's several sections, but one, let's say this, those ahadith, uh, which uh, الأحاديث المعلّة بالاختلاف في إبدال الإسناد كاملا فوق الزهري. So those which the chain is completely changed when it comes to after Zuhri, after Imam Zuhri. So for example, there's a famous hadith: إذا سمع أحدكم المؤذن يتشهد فليقول مثل قولي. This is from Abu Huraira that if any of you hears the muazzin, the person saying the adhan, then let him saying أشهد ولا إله then let him repeat like what he's hearing. Now, Zuhri transmits this. Farawahu, this is transmitted by Abdul Rahman ibn Ishaq from Zuhri, who transmits it from Sa'id, Sa'id ibn Musayyib from Abu Huraira. But yet in another narration, um, it's transmitted uh, from Zuhri, from Ata ibn Yazid, from Abu Sa'id ibn al-Khudri. And Dar Qutni mentions that is the correct one. Wahu sahih Okay. Now, uh, Right, and that is, I believe, transmitted by Imam Malik, if I'm correct as well. The correct one. So, but the point being, nevertheless, is that there was a, a full chain which was transmitted incorrectly. So after Imam Zuhri, the chain, which is a Sahih chain from Sa'id ibn Musayyib, who is a don uh, from Abu Huraira. But this people, somebody has got it wrong. It wasn't even from these people. It was from Zuhri, from you had in this chain uh, from Atta ibn Yazid, from Abu Sa'id and Al-Khudri. Okay, so that's, and it's got several examples. Uh, I just quoted that as an uh, example. What was this one I've got here? Um, this is just to show why, th because this is interesting, that look, there's another hadith, um, and this is a popular one. You guys might have heard of this. La hasada illa fitnatayn. That Rajalun Allahu Malan, that there is no um, jealousy except in two things. You guys have probably heard of this hadith. It's very popular. That jealousy is only permitted in two things. One is in wealth that a person spends in the name of God, and and one it mentions about uh, knowledge, or in some versions about somebody who recites the Quran. Now, this is transmitted generally from, once again, with the famous chain, from Zuhri, from Sa'id ibn Musayyib, from Abu Huraira. But the correct version is that's actually a wrong chain. Uh, yet, that's how it's transmitted. The correct chain, as Dar Qutni mentions, is from Zuhri, from Salim, from his father, Ibn Umar. Okay. And then he goes through the whole uh, discussion here to kind of show where this Hadith in all these different books where it appears um, and why. But nevertheless, I just thought I'll mention that, that this is a, a fascinating book. It comes in four volumes. Um, I did buy it earlier on this year, um, but I, I am finding it quite fascinating, I must say. So it's called Marwiyatul Imam Zuhri Al Mu'alla. So the narrations of Imam Zuhri that are problematized. And and illa, I have translated people. I have <laughs> bandana cheese. <laughs> you know, in the in the uh, like subcontinent culture, when they start kind of saying, when they want to kind of be humble, they start overdoing it, <laughs> and they start like saying, you know, like 
al haqir al abdul haqir the despised one <laughs> ahqar the most despised has done so. you know like when they're trying to say i've done it they will say oh this instead of saying this humble servant or this humble, they'll say the most despised the most wretched <laughs> the most crippled <laughs> right so anyway so i've translated the term this thing of ilal uh, hadith which is a science as um, as hadith or textual pathology people so because an illa is a kind of like a disease or a kind of that's what it is like an illness okay so ilal hadith is like hadith or textual pathology uh, or narratorial narratorial pathology people and these ilal are pathogens okay narratorial pathogens wah sounds so narratorial <laughs> right so let me put that there so what i'm going to do is i'll explain what this this whole discussion is on a woman uh that wants that is looking to get married does she need her guardian's present or her guardian wali and then we'll look at what this is based on and the problems there so the uh the madhabs the schools within sunni islam this is how they view this issue so the hanafi madhab uh, is very clear that a woman does not need and this is imam abu hanifa by the way imam abu hanifa i should be more precise because um his two fellow companions kind of betrayed him on this one <laughs> right if i can use the term betrayal <laughs> but imam abu hanifa who was the true don and legend unlike i mean his two companions but he imam abu hanifa says that a woman does not need a uh a wali okay is very clear on this point this is uh, imam abu hanifa and other sc- subsequent squ- scholars like abu ja'far at-tahawi support his view and argue in defense of it okay in his book sharh maani al-athar amongst other works as well then you have the madhabs like the shafi'i madhab and the hanbali madhab they are very clear and like the salafis today the wahhabis and they are very clear that a woman's nikah without a wali without a guardian present is batil batil people batil it's invalid if Inval- not even the if batil batil people is batil so that's so you got on one side you've got Imam Abu Hanifa the other side you've got people like Imam Shafi'i you've got uh the Hanbali madhab right now the Maliki madhab is a bit i feel unclear on this in its apparent reading it reads that it appears or it's presented let me put it like this this is a better way of putting it it's presented with this camp in saying that oh imam malik also said that a woman a woman cannot marry without her wali yet aha aha you see aha right so yet in the mudawwana and this is uh, quoting from the mudawwana as well this is azhab al madhabi uh, madhabi malik this was written by ibn abi zaid al qairawani the legend uh, also called young malik in defense it's called in defense of the maliki madhab or the madhab of malik now you see you will find a quote from imam malik where he's asked uh so he's asked that what do you say about the opinion of malik fil mar'a tawakkilu rajalan uh, rajulan ghayra waliha ala aqd nikahiha Uh anyway speaking about what do you say about this a woman who doesn't get a wali she gets another man to say can you just read my nikah or about the slave uh, woman who does this or so on now wa anna and this is the quote you see and this is in the mudawwana as well 
تو ان المرء الدنيئه او الفقيره that a poor woman or a woman that is of low status now this is interesting i'll come back to this point الدنيئه the one who is of low status اذا تزوجت بغير ولي فنكاحهما جميعا جائز what do you have to say about that okay so he then goes on to say that look uh he ibn abi zaid doesn't support that by the way but that's in the mudawwana of imam malik to, uh, by ibn qasim hence he's addressing it here and he goes on to say that you know fa farraqa bayna al ghaniyati wal faqira fi al hukm bila dalil min kitab wala sunna wala ijma he says that you know this distinction was made between the rich woman and the poor woman without any evidence from the quran or sunna and so on um and then he kind of goes on to say look that it's sometimes confusing it appears to be that imam malik sometimes seems to be saying this sometimes seems to be saying that and so on nevertheless let's get back to the point you see imam malik seems to make a distinction now this distinction is important because on one hand he seems to be in line with these uh, like the shafi'is and these people saying that no a woman cannot get married without a wali but then he says when he's asked about a woman who let's say is of lowly status now by the way some people have interpreted as on a tangent i want to mention this here some people have uh, wrongly interpreted that and i will highlight that they've said things like uh, like in the sharh al kabir and you'll find a few books uh, that they wrongly uh, even see the ahmad zarruq and other people the suqi and all these people um they some of them have said who is that who can a, a woman of low status be who and some of them have said things like oh converts or al muslimania or they've said who doesn't have a lineage or wealth or who who isn't beautiful or they've said a black woman now i just want to clarify and condemn that that statement is wrong right that was never said ever that was not a statement of imam malik this was hundreds of years after imam malik right imam malik in his mudawwana just says the word dania which is somebody of lowly status he says that she doesn't need a wali now people like see the ahmad zarruq or these other people they come like five you're talking and some of them between 600 years after imam malik to whether it's going to be 800 to 1000 years after imam malik some of these people commenting on this writing these things that is racist it is wrong okay so whatever is wrong we condemn it and that was not said by imam malik just to be very clear he did he did say dania he uses the word dania which means lowly status now these people later on in their times are saying who has lowly status oh a muslimania you know a convert has lowly status or this has lowly status that's their interpretation being superimposed but now let's come back to because the reason i'm saying that is it's important um uh, you see this just shows that somebody you know like people said to me oh uh like why do you condemn um this hadith as problematic the one of the age of aisha being 6 when the scholars in the past didn't have a problem with it but we have to understand that a lot of the these scholars in the past that they're looking at from the medieval age they had many outlooks on life which we would condemn and many of them did have racist outlooks on life as well so we would condemn that as well so you know so just to be clear that even these people who criticize me for saying that look uh, you know you are being critical of this hadith but ibn hajar and all these people who came afterwards accept this hadith of the age of aisha being 6 and you're saying it's not acceptable but all most of those scholars if you look in their works they will also have racist tendencies and they will see it as absolutely normal like they won't see that as they're even discriminating they will just take it as a given like yeah of course black people are down there now th- they'll see that as just like i'm not being racist that's just a fact they will think of it as a fact so 
just because scholars have said it doesn't make it correct okay so it's not from Allah it's not from his messenger it's not from the Quran or Sunnah and it's not even in that case from the Salaf this is from scholars of the medieval age right so just putting that uh, aside coming back to this point the reason Imam Malik distinguishes this it's important why because it shows us why the Wali was important in their eyes the guardian was important because it was all to do with status in society. It wasn't actually something to do with a divine commandment from God. It was more about not breach about not breaching the peace, not having kind of social discord or disunity or or, or to kind of keep maintain a social cohesion. So in their society they felt if a woman was to get married like this, it's going to cause problems. So they said it was necessary. Now that's not so clear in like the other people's views, but in Imam Malik's view, when he made this distinction in saying, well, if a woman didn't really have that kind of a status, it make, it's no big deal. It showed so, ah, so it's not actually from Allah or his messenger. Because if it was, then it would apply to everybody regardless. That's an important point, people. And by the way, this is what you find. Uh, I can't actually see any comments, by the way. Let me just see. Oh. Oh, right. So that might be because. All right, I don't know what I've. No. Nope. But I didn't actually do anything, so I don't know how that happened. <laughs> so, nevertheless, coming back to this point, right, so I can't see, for some reason I can just see who's watching, but I can't see the comments, and I was confusing, 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 confusing. Uh, let me just press this, see what does that do, nope. Anyway, right, let's get back to this point. Now, I want to take a look at a hadith. Now, most people will tell you that there are several ahadith to say that a woman cannot marry without her guardian. La nikaha illa bi wali. Uh, this is one book, for example, that is dedicated to this entire topic. I mean, among several others, this particular one, at tahqiq al jali, li hadith la nikaha illa bi wali. Now, what's interesting is uh, this hadith of there is no nikah except with a wali is transmitted from several companions although all of these chains are problematic and I will come to that point in just a moment but before I do I want to highlight some of the discrepancies some of the issues that people have been transmitting for centuries on end Right now, for example, this hadith is transmitted uh, for example by Al Hakim in his Mustadrak. Abu Abdullah Al Hakim and Nisapuri in his Mustadrak, he brings the hadith La Nikaha illa bi wali. And then he says that Fakad Akhrajahu min hadith Aisha wa Abi Musa al Ashari. So these two people, Aisha and Abu Musa al Ashari. And you'll realize that these are the only real chains in this whole chapter from Aisha radiallahu anha and from Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. And they have problems, but I'll come to that in a moment. But then he says, Wafil bab. And in this chapter, we have hadith from, uh, this is uh, Al-Hakim uh, Al writing, from Ali radiallahu an, from Abdullah ibn Abbas, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, Abdullah ibn Umar, Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari, Mighdad ibn al-Aswad, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Jabir ibn Abdullah, Abu Huraira, Imran ibn Hussein, Abdullah ibn Amr, Miswar ibn Makhrama, Anas ibn Malik. And then, so that's, I've counted out 13. It says, wa akhtharuha sahiha. Okay. Chalo. <laughs> a bit of a blag there, akhtharuha <laughs> sahiha. No problem, no problem. But, uh, 
So he brings 13 people. Now, these riwayat come from uh, this, uh, this other narrations coming. People will present narrations from Umar ibn al-Khattab and other people. There's, there's issues with a lot of these, but the point that I'm trying to get to, uh, Hafid ibn Hajar, um, it is stated, so people start transmitting um, from Hafid ibn Hajj al-Asqalani when he's commenting on this in his notes, in his Amali, upon the Mustadrak of al-Hakim. So people transmit, who come after Ibn Hajar transmit his words where he says, وَفِي الْبَابِ عَنْ عَلِي ibn Abi Talib وَابْنَ Abbas ثُمَّ سَرَدَ تَمَامَ الثَّلَاثِينَ صَحَابِيًا That he transmits 30 companions, 30, 3, 0. That's, it says the word, ثَلَاثِينَ صَحَابِيًا now, there's a big problem here because that is not true. Okay, now everybody starts to... This thing, uh, what Ibn Hajar wrote, everybody does kind of... They kind of copy and paste what he said here. That, that Al-Hakim then goes on to mention 30. What he meant to say was 13. Thalatha Ashar, but he said Thalathin. Now you'll see people like Shokani transmit that statement from him, Sanani transmits it from him. Um, you'll see Katani in his Nazmul Mutanathir. You see, Katani writes a book about Mutawatir Hadith, Hadith that have been transmitted by so many people. He transmits this statement of Ibn Hajar, 30 companions. Zayla'i, uh, right, no, sorry. And you'll get other people transmitting this. Now the truth is that that was actually a mistake because there are not 30 uh, people that have actually kind of said that. Okay, so it's 13. Right, okay, now. Now the problem with all of these chains that have come, not a sink, you'll find that all of these are the companions that they quote, whether it's going to be from Abu Huraira, whether it's going to be from Umar ibn Khattab, all of them are massively problematic, okay, massively. You'll find, first of all, they're not even, they're just, a lot of them are not even hadith, they're just statements like, so for example, somebody said to Umar, like, get up and marry her off to so-and-so. So they're using that as a delil as well, that why did they say to Umar, why didn't they just do it themselves? But that's not a decisive, that could have just been by choice. They could have just said, you know, do this. It didn't mean that... So it's not actually clear statements, just to make that clear, okay? A lot of these are like that. A lot of them are mawkuf, so they're not actually from the Prophet. They're just companions saying their opinions. Um, however, the, the, the two narrations that can stand some weight, the two that come down, are from Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, which is transmitted uh, from his son Abu Burda. Now this is the hadith that Tirmidhi um, brings and he he kind of like goes on and uh, and supports and he does highlight the ikhtilaf in it. The issue with this hadith, the issue with this hadith first of all, and the other one is to do with Aisha. So these two chains we're going to look at just very quite, quite briefly, I mean not too much depth, is that this hadith of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari is transmitted, right? You've got this through... Certain chains, one is by Abu Ishaq, and it's a popular narration. Um, this, the problem with this chain is many people who are transmitting this hadith, like legends who are greater than Abu Ishaq, like Shu'ba, Sufyan al Thawri, they say that this hadith does not actually go to Abu Musa, it's his son Abu Burda saying it directly from the Prophet, which makes this chain broken. Okay. Which means that you can't actually rely on it. Okay. Uh, this is one of the key issues that Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi relies on when he's refuting this whole chapter. Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi says that, look, listen, you guys are presenting these ahadith. And the truth is that these hadith uh, from Abu Musa al-Ashari Major Hufad, Amir al-Mu'mineen, legends of hadith who transmit this same hadith, 
do not even mention him in the chain it stops with his son abu burda and he is not he does he does not take from the prophet so this chain is incomplete okay so that is uh, one of the key problems you have straight away with that chain and i know people will say that uh, some people have accepted it of course they have but what i'm trying to show and i know here You see, like, they're going to show Bukhari's comment. Now, Bukhari's comment, when he was uh, discussing this with uh, most likely Tirmidhi, who, does, who transmits it, he says that when he was asked about this hadith from Israel, from Isra, Abi Ishaq, from Abi Burda, from his father, La Nikah, Illa Bi Wali, he said, look, I know it's got some extra in it, but we'll accept it. Even though Shu'ba and Thawri say it was not a complete chain, but he says, look, like it's okay we can still go with it that's fine that's his choice i'm not saying that but the truth is that shu'ba is called amirul mu'minina fil hadith he said this chain was not connected sufiana thawri who's once again greater than abu ishaq and uh, and these people is saying that this chain is not connected so you have okay now this other chain that we have, Dar Qutni brings this in when critiquing Zuhri's hadith. Why? Because he says Dar Qutni was asked about the hadith of Ibn Musayyib from Abu Huraira, La Tunkahul Mar'a illa bi wali, that a woman is not married except through except with her guardian present. He says this this chain from Saeed, from Zuhri, from Saeed ibn Musayyib, from Abu Huraira is wrong. It ought to be that Zuhri from Urwa, from Aisha. Okay, this is how the chain ought to be. Now what's interesting people, this is an interesting point, that this he goes on to bring several other, uh, Darqutni goes on to bring several chains to support this, and he shows that who has transmitted this hadith. So he'll, he'll go on and say, look, from Sa'id ibn Musayyib, from Abu Huraira, this is transmitted by Tabrani. Who transmits it? Uh, Umar ibn Qais. Who else transmits it? Suleiman ibn Arqam. So Umar ibn Qais, Suleiman ibn Arqam. And then he mentions that there is an extra, now this is an important point, there is an extra, an, ad, an adage, an addition in that hadith that says, La nikaha illa bi wali, a woman cannot get married except with a wali, wa shahidai adl, and two witnesses. The interesting thing, people, this hadith of two witnesses, right, uh, only is brought by, the, by, by this chain. That you'll see that this thing of Ibn Hibban mentions that... Uh, that this la yasihu fi dhikri shahidain ghayru hadha al-khabar okay so you'll see this thing of that there must be two witnesses present is only valid in one single chain at most which is an interesting point since it's you know accepted by almost everybody uh, <laughs> and it's based on a very weak kind of chain um, I find that quite fascinating and that's why the Maliki Madhab said that witnesses are not necessary for a nikah to take place, simply an announcement is made. Because it's not proven from the Prophet anyway that he said witnesses were present. That this hadith uh, that we have of Suleiman ibn Arqam, that la nikah illa bi wali, um, has tafarrud in it. Um, now, just highlighting some points here. Although this hadith is transmitted in many books of La Nikah Illa Bi Wali from Aisha, coming that she mentioned uh, this Khatib al Baghdadi brings it, Bayhaqi, Humaydi, Ibn Abi Shayba, Dawood, Tirmidhi, Nasa'i, Ibn Hibban. There's up to, in fact, 21 people transmitting it, all of them going through Zuhri. Going through Zuhri. This is important. Ibn Juraj is the one who is taking it before him. Now, Ibn Juraj from Suleiman Ibn Musa from Ibn Shihab. 
Now, what's interesting, this is a point I want you to focus on. Imam Ahmad brings in his Musnad that from Ismail ibn Ulayya, that from Ibn Juraj, who says that Suleiman ibn Musa told us this from Zuhri. Ibn Juraj says, then I met Zuhri. Now, this is an important point because the Hanafiya use this as a Dalil. And those people who say a Wali is not necessary. Because the first, remember I said this whole thing is based on two hadith. One of Abu Musa, which many scholars like Shu'bah, Sufyan Thawri said was not a connected chain. The other on Aisha, from Urwa, from Aisha. Now the interesting thing is that Zuhri who transmits this, and from him Suleiman ibn Musa, ibn Juraj says that he takes this hadith from them. He says, I met Zuhri, which he does meet him. He says, I asked him about this hadith. فَسَأَلْتُهُ عَنْ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ فَلَمْ يَعْرِفُهُ He himself didn't know it. <laughs> Zuhri himself, who is the transmitter of this hadith, so many people are transmitting it from him. Ibn Juraj says, when I asked him about this hadith, لَمْ يَعْرِفُهُ He himself didn't know it. This was one of the key reasons that many scholars abandoned this hadith and narration from uh, of Aisha through Zuhri because they said that uh, this was the only strongest chain that they had and this was the only chain that is coming through Ibn Juraj from Zuhri that mentioned two witnesses is also necessary and this is the chain regarding which uh, regarding which Ibn Hibban said that لا يسح في ذكر الشاهدين غير هذا الخبر. This was the only one that we had sound where it mentioned two witnesses. But Ibn Juraj himself is saying, although Suleiman Ibn Musa told me that Zuhri said this from Urwa from Aisha, but when I met Zuhri, he himself did not know this narration, and Zuhri himself is one of the scholars that gives the fatwa that a woman can get married without a wali. So you can see people that this was the key. Uh, now, there was a lot of kalam, like the names I mentioned before, by the way, the people that transmit this, uh, some of the people earlier on from the other chain, Umar ibn Qais, uh, the unacceptable Suleiman ibn Arqam, uh, is considered matruq al-hadith, rejected, da'if. This one of even Zuhri from Urwa, from Aisha, Suleiman ibn Musa. Uh, right, even Nasa'i said about him, he's unacceptable, he's not strong in hadith. He said his hadith are problematic. Abu Hatim said, fi hadithi, uh, wa fi hadithihi, ba'du al-ittirabs, his hadith contradict themselves at times. Uh, Ibn Adi mentioned he, he, that he mentions hadith which nobody else transmits at time. So there were issues with this nevertheless. Uh, but my point being, I want to just put that down for now. My point being that this whole chapter, now if you look at this, we were going from this thing of some people like Al-Kattani in his book, Nazm al-Mutanathir, is saying this is mutawatir. This hadith is so well distributed that it's certain knowledge it's like knowing that china exists this is how certain this knowledge is but upon analysis and dissection we come to find that first of all none of these chains can even stand any decent rigorous kind of analysis apart from two which was from abu musa al-ash'ari and from Aisha, the problem with Abu Musa al-Ash'ari's chain is those who transmit it, those who transmit it that were known as Amir al Mu'minina fil Hadith, like Shu'ba and Sufyan, uh, they themselves say that uh, this is not from Abu Musa, but his son Abu Burda is transmitting it as a broken chain from the Prophet. So with that, that chain drops, people. Then you have the other one of Aisha, and this chain of Aisha radiallahu an is the only one standing, and that comes through Urwa, through Ibn Shihab, 
from him Suleiman ibn Musa, who Nasa'i says is unacceptable, who other people have problematized, coming through Ibn Juraj and then from up to 20 people transmitting it. But Ibn Juraj himself saying, when I met Ibn Shihab and asked him, Ibn Shihab himself did not know this hadith. And his own fatwa was that this is permissible. So, with that, we can conclude that forget mutawatir. <laughs> forget mutawatir. This hadith is not even sahih. Okay. And other people may challenge that understanding. They may say, well, we want to accept it. Fine, accept it. But you can't critique those people who don't accept it because they have a firm stance, a firm foundation to build their understanding on. So that was the Hadithi discussion on why there is not a single undisputed, categorical, conclusive Hadith, Sarih and Sahih, right, without criticism on that a woman must have a guardian to conduct her nikah. Okay, so it is so based on that, people, it is not necessary for a woman to have, according to the Qur'an and Sunnah, the Qur'an and Sunnah clearly. Right now, that said, I would say, I would like to follow up now from a, so we've got that clear, that, you know, from the clear sources, we know that, okay, from the Qur'an and Sunnah, uh, the Qur'an can be interpreted either side. So there's some verses which uh, show that a woman can marry herself. So, for example, when uh, the the verse about talaq, and it mentions that uh, until she marries So some verses imply this. Some verses imply that oh, when you are marrying them off. Uh, so the Quran can be interpreted either way. It doesn't speak clearly on this matter. One thing we know for sure is that women. Uh, were independent generally on several matters and in some things it was a patriarchal society unquestionably. Now there is a hadith that Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi brings that uh, Aisha radiallahu anha marries her niece off who is uh, Abdurrahman's daughter. Her name was Hafsa. So her brother Abdurrahman was away on a journey. She marries her off. Abdurrahman comes back and is quite upset actually that how come you know you didn't wait for me and you didn't ask me. And she says that if you want, I'll call it off. Like, I mean, I mean, we can, you know, if we want, we can end it. And he says, no, like, don't be silly. Why? Why would we do that? The interesting point is nobody says that it's invalid. So Aisha is clearly not a man marrying off her own niece here. So that is one of the main evidences. So from the Sunnah, we find nothing conclusive. We find doubtful narrations. Uh, either side, one thing we can understand is so. So we can put the, we've got the schools of law, the Hanafi school uh, or Imam Abu Hanifa, Zufar. You've got scholars like Shabi, uh, Az Zuhri. You've got um, Sufyan Al Thawri, and I would say Imam Malik as well. Okay, in this camp, that don't believe that this is a necessary condition, and then you've got other scholars like uh, Imam Shafi'i and Ahmed Ibn Hanbal. Like I said, people may try to put Imam Malik in that camp, but when you look at his fatwas I presented, it shows that he clearly understood this was more a social thing and not a divine matter from God. So now I would like to say, well, look, that all said, people need to take social uh, their social reality into consideration. I would advise that always it is always a, that it is always important. To have your guardians involved. Okay, I will advise that. Uh, it is always important to have them involved where it is so long as it is actually possible. Um, I think people shouldn't embark on just these kind of, um, these very um, secret kind of marriages and things like this. I, I think these things most often lead to more problems than not. Um, so that is my advice. I'm not advocating things like that. I am advocating that we you do always have your family involved because 
family will always it will give you some credence it will give you some support and having that completes the ceremony for you as far as it being meaningful okay counts so that's what i would advise the other thing is that what if the parents do not allow uh, the marriage then i would say look i would say look it still depends if it's something totally stupid uh, like they're saying, the only reason we're not allowing this relationship is because of something like caste, for example, which many people surprisingly still do. I would say things like that are ridiculous. Um, and it's your choice. It's your life. Islamically, you are entitled to conduct a nikah. If they're not saying objecting to things like that, they're objecting to matters which are actually make sense. Like, wait a minute. How will this person even support you? How will you embark on this relationship? The person, you know, he doesn't seem legitimate or he's involved in crime or he's involved in this. Then I think their concerns are 100% genuine and well-placed. And, you know, quite often you will find that matters will unfold as they advise. That things just mess up. So I would say, look, maybe take their advice if it's like that because it's not a fairy tale. <laughs> it's not just uh, Bollywood, you know, you're not just going to sing a few songs and that's life done for you. So I would say it's, it is your call ultimately, it is your life and you will have to live it. Um, Islam kind of leaves things. It's not God, what God is saying, but I would say that there is some sense. It is always, I would always advise to have family involved so long as it is actually possible. Okay. So cool people, I think that kind of answers uh, that mas'ala, which I think a lot of people have asked, that must a woman have a wali present. One thing we have seen, that there is not a single sahih, sarih hadith that can stand the test of criticism, um, that is uncriticized. Okay, so cool. With that, we'll put, I'll, t I'll tell you what, I'll take a few rapid round questions. I can't seem to see any comments. I don't know what on earth is going on. I can just see who is watching. Uh, my comments seem to have disappeared. And so I'll take a few that have already been maybe put on the... Why is that? Admin, what is going on? <laughs> what are you guys doing? Huh? <laughs> Who's on admin duty? What is... Uh... ¿Qué estás haciendo? <laughs> What's going on? Let me see. Does the crescent and star symbol have any Islamic relevance? Uh, Allah refers to a moon god because of this symbol. Um, hmm. Although the ancient Arabs did worship a kind of moon god, I don't, they didn't identify Allah as that moon god. So I don't believe that has any... What is interesting is, is the research done on uh, Sinai. And Sin, uh, Sinin, which is in northwest Arabia, because Sin did refer to the moon god. And it seems that the the people that took that kind of religion from the, the Babylonians, so the people of Shu'aib and those who preceded him, did in that region used to worship the moon god. And when Musa uh, salam, brings, he comes there and brings the Israelites to Jabal al um, and hence this whole thing... That is interesting that that re kind of religion was taken into Arabia. Um, but they didn't used to refer to the moon god as Allah. Uh, and the prophet. And in Islam, this star crescent is not. This is something that came much after. Much after. Okay. All right. Other than that, what else is going on? What are other. Mm, these comments, I think I've answered most of these. All right. Is it. I can't seem to see. Let me see if I can. Oh, I can see some of the comments here, I think. Uh, somebody said, my whole point is you cannot reconcile religion and freedom. Hmm. But I feel that you can reconcile it to a great degree, much greater degree. You definitely can. I think in. In our daily life, we always will have some restrictions on freedoms. So, for example, we don't say we have the freedom to kill people. 
Um, there will always be, all human beings will recognize limitations to freedom, um, which I think is, is done in a very reasonable way. So I don't think that's a problem. But I just feel that some of the, 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 the limitations placed by the clergy are misplaced. Okay. They're more a result of institutionalized religion than Islam in itself. Does nail polish invalidate wudu? Halal nail polish and makeup necessary or crazy? <laughs> Elizabeth is asking this. You see, I, in my understanding, I've highlighted before that you don't need halal nail polish, although there are these products now available. I feel, uh, feel that nail polish is absolutely fine. You can do wudu upon it. You do not need to kind of go um, buy certain products. But that's up to you. You can buy those products if it makes you feel better. Um, I think that because in Islam, we are only asked to wash the apparent. Uh, we are not asked. So if the varnish or the polish takes the layer of the apparent, then you just wash the apparent. Same goes with hair dye, hair gel, any of these things. Makeup, you just wash the apparent. Okay. And hence Imam Malik, when he's asked in his famous fatwa about a person who wears a ring, that do they have to remove the ring? Um, during wudu and he says no and they say well what if the ring is very tight so his water cannot permeate um, or pass under the ring he said even if so this shows that it's not necessary people uh, freedom is hedonist in it oh hedonist hedonist this uh, what else is going on somebody said islam is not for everyone mm, perhaps perhaps or maybe the way it's presented is not for everyone uh what what would you cl class what would you classify the correct or closest to the hanafi fiqh mm, i think the hanafi fiqh was an amazing madhab as it was laid out by imam abu hanifa but that madhab has kind of morphed and mutated into this very institutionalized version that we have today that is not reminiscent of uh, imam abu hanifa in the slightest so Cool. What else is going on, people? What else is going on? Was there any... I think we should wrap it up shortly. Was there any um, masala to... Uh... All right. I did ask for... I don't know. I don't think I got it sent to it there. Let me see something. Um... Nope. Mm, nope, nope, nope. Didn't get that. Okay, cool. Uh... What else is going on, people? Any interesting? The Mufti Masala of the <laughs> the gossip, people, the gossip, the gossip. Well, as I can see, there's uh, been another video, uh, the gossip section, Mufti Masala section. <laughs> so there's been another video from uh, the Diobandis uh, who are calling out Asrar Rashid, Mullah Asrar. Uh, people, <laughs> I watched this other video where it said, right, <laughs> you will have to answer. So they've dropped in some uh, brilvi blasphemies of calling the prophet God. And this is just, they said, this, this is like a trailer, trailer of what's to come. <laughs> uh, uh, interesting, interesting. So... Ah, all this masala. What else has been going on? I did actually want to play a clip, but I haven't got it here. It's hilarious, actually. Oh, God. I did ask some of the, the lads to send me the... Cause they'd sent it before, but they haven't... I don't have it now. But uh, there's actually a debate going on in... Um, I mean, there's a debate that the Diobandis kind of make reference to in their first video... Uh, by a scholar called Molana Bandialvi, uh, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, who's up north somewhere, I think Bradford, I'm not sure where, where, up north somewhere, in Bradford, I think. So they go to debate him, and they have certain points. So his, they're speaking about the Ibarat, the, the problematic quotes of the Diobandi Akabir, and he is saying to them that, right, okay, I want you to list out these Three. He wants them to list these three problematic uh, Diobandi kind of statements. So he's from a Brilvi background. And this is the, the debate that the Diobandi calling out Asrar was making reference to. 
Now, in this discussion, that scholar Molana Bandialvi is saying to them that I want you to list these three problematic statements. Let's discuss them. So I want you to write them out first. So they are saying, oh, but we found equal statements said by the Obandi scholars. Uh, sorry, by Brailvi scholars. So your scholars have said very similar things. How would you answer that? So he is insisting, no, uh, let's discuss this first. So, and in it, he says, <laughs> he says, right, because he begins by saying, it's in Urdu, and he's saying, write them in Kulliko, one, two, three. This is what he's saying. But then the whole thing becomes, one, two, three, karo, one, two, three. <laughs> and it becomes so hilarious. You've got to hear it, people. It's such a shame I, I didn't have it. I want to actually play it out, but I can't seem to find it right now. Uh, and it, in it, he just keeps saying this. Oh, one, two, three, karo, one, two, three. <laughs> and he just non-stop. One, two, three, go, one, two, three, go, one, two, three, go, one, two, three, right? So people, that was hilarious to watch. I got to say, uh, you, you, <laughs> it's a long debate, pure shouting going on, but that part in it is epic and it continues. It becomes a, a motif, a kind of theme that runs right through that discussion. One, two, three, go, one, two, three. So people with that, I think we should wrap it up. That's some, um, uh, any interesting things, reach out to me. Any interesting discussions, dialogues, masala, reach out to me, share it with me, people. Other than that, I hope you're having an awesome, uh, hope you're having an awesome time and things are going very well, inshallah. Remember one thing, always keep a positive outlook on life, okay? If you smile, if you keep happy, you will see reasons to be happy. Okay, if you keep a very pessimistic outlook, if you're kind of always, mm, <laughs> then you'll just see more reasons <laughs> to be sad and like, why does, why does the world always <laughs> do me over? But it's actually not like that. You know, I've met a lot of people that are quite pessimistic sometimes um, and change. You know, you meet people, by the way, this is just a little tip from a psychological perspective. It's. It's in your subconscious speech. So your subconscious speech reflects the state of mind. And it's like a they kind of impact each other the way they, they kind of work. So, for example, people like, let's say, you, you as simple as things like asking somebody, how are you? And the way people respond. So people, you'll find so many people saying things like, oh, you know, not bad or you know, things have been worse or not, not bad, I guess. See, what a negative way to respond. What a negative way. Like, what, what, what do people mean by not bad? I mean, I understand what they mean. <laughs> but what, a, like, there's so much, like, they could equally say, yeah, things are good. Alhamdulillah, awesome, chilling. All right, <laughs> rocking, rock on. They could say anything because there are many things that are also awesome. I'm sure there are many things that are problematic in life as well, but there's many awesome things going on uh, as well. You know, the <laughs> I know there's a lot of, what's that? Uh, <laughs> what, what's that? gabra <laughs> ke <laughs> that there was so many sorrows or problems that I became frightened and I resorted to drink. <laughs> he says, I just had a bit of happiness. So what I did is I just mixed that into my drink and drank it. to <laughs> janam it's not that I've drank since birth. Sharab ko tanha dekha, taras kha ke pi gaya. He says, I saw alcohol so lonely. I felt sorry. It's from my empathy that I felt sorry. I was like, yaar pilo, yaar pilo. 
So with that, people, have an awesome time. Take very good care of yourselves till next week, inshallah. Stay blessed. Stay smiling, inshallah. May Allah keep you all smiling. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.